I'm delighted to be here with you. And, and I actually sat in on that previous session. I enjoyed it very much. So I'm eager to try to make my small contribution to your conference, which I understand is the 52nd annual conference of the Engineering and Construction Contracting uh, Group, ECC. Uh, let me begin by uh, telling you, I, I noticed that uh, as that, with that very kind introduction, uh, it was highlighted that I was one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential world leaders at one point. But, you know, I, uh, just by way of uh, making sure you know not to be too impressed by that, I, when, I, when I received the award, my executive officer actually, I was still the chairman. My executive officer came in and, and said to me, uh, generally, you're not going to believe this, but uh, you just you were just named one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential world leaders. And I said, you're right, uh, John, I, I don't believe it. And he said, no, I was just kidding. I, why don't you believe that? I said, well, I'm not even the most influential person in my own house. And he, of course, knew exactly what I meant by that. But, but the other part of it was uh, I was eager to see where I'd be placed in the magazine. You can't help but, but wonder about that. And so as the magazine was published and hit the bookshelves, I snuck off without my security detail down to the local Barnes and Noble, intending to buy five or six copies from my immediate family members and, and one for myself. And uh, as I stood there in line with the magazines, I was flipping through to try to figure out where I was in the magazine. And I found myself um, juxtaposed right between Kim Jong-un, the dictator from North Korea, and Kanye West. And so I thought to myself, well, that's not exactly the kind of influence I thought I was, uh, I was going to have uh, in, in the magazine. In any case, it was a humbling experience, but, but nevertheless an interesting one. So I join you here today. I really uh, love the uh, topic, the idea to action and talk to traction. I'd like to be so bold as to actually add two others to your plate that at least from my perspective are equally important. One is challenge the opportunity. I mean, I clearly we're living, the fact that we're doing this virtually, I was hoping to be with you in San Marco Island, actually. So clearly the fact that we're doing this the way we are means we've been challenged by a few things and we'll get to some of them in a moment. Um, and, but I think as the previous speaker said, it's all about finding the opportunity in that challenge and not allowing that challenge to bear down on us too deeply. And then the last one I would suggest to you is fear to resilience, because one of the things that is very clear to me as I, as I uh, continue to try to do leadership engagements and teaching at Duke University is that all of this uncertainty and, and these tumultuous times and these challenges do generate a certain amount of fear that we're not accustomed to. And, and we have to make sure that that fear is, we, that we don't let it uh, paralyze us. And, and that, it, it, that if under the best of circumstances, it becomes something that actually encourages us to be more resilient and to try to take advantage of change. Well, let me start by telling you why I think this period of time in our, in our lifetimes is, is different. I mean, I, you know, I'm not gonna probably tell you anything that's a, uh, you know, a revelation to you, but I do think it's worth kind of reviewing the way things have changed and not just in 2020. I mean, I, you know, I think we got to think about how leadership itself has changed in the, let's call it the post 9-11 environment. And I picked, I picked 9-11 to start, you know, that thinking about what's changed because, um, you know, our, our, our relative degree of self-confidence, the way the rest of the world reacted to that event, the way we eventually have acted, uh, reacted to that event, the great, unbelievable, really technological changes that have occurred in that period of time. And one of the things, one of the ways I describe it is we live in a world of, uh, which is kind of an era of digital echoes. The idea being that, you know, the ideas that the, that, that as information becomes more ubiquitous, more uh, faster, more complex, and echoes that it it puts an additional pressure on leaders to be sense makers, and I'll and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Not just leaders, by the way, but followers. And pretty much everything I say to you today will be applicable whether you're a leader or a follower. And it should be obvious to all of us that. Um, you know, we, we spend a, a long career and or long careers, plural, 
But the majority of the time, we, we are either someone's follower or a trusted advisor. And it's only rarely that you, you actually get to be the, the CEO or the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And so these attributes that I would suggest to you in a moment are applicable uh, all across the spectrum of activities. I'd also say this era is, is characterized by intense scrutiny. You know, it was Bismarck in the 19th century who said that people who love democracy, he actually said love laws, but he was talking about democracy. People who love democracy and people who love sausage shouldn't really want to see how each of those are made. And, I, you know, I, I just think that now we see everything all the time, everywhere on the move. And, uh, and it's, it makes it, it makes it especially challenging for those of us who lead and those who follow. And the result of all that, by the way, uh, is what I would call a deepening um, sense of skepticism, maybe, and a deepening uh, deficit of trust. So that's, you know, that's why things are harder. If you're wondering why they're harder, that's probably a good place to start. And then along came, along came 2020. That was all before 2020. And so to that, we had the three converging crises of a pandemic, of an economy that suffers the effects of that pandemic, and also the effects of some long-term um, vulnerabilities. And then, of course, the issues related to racial injustice in the country. And all three of those have converged at the same time, really over the course of not much more than 90 days, they've converged. And again, what, what I want you to, to to think about in terms of the so what of it all. So what if they converged? Yes, it made it more complex. Yes, it put leaders under greater pressure and greater scrutiny. But it also raised the level of, of the innate level of fear in the country. In this case, in 2020, it's fear for our health, the health of our parents, the health of our children, the health of our coworkers. Um, in terms of the economy, I mean, many, many, many people have lost their jobs or been furloughed or or didn't get the same compensation they thought they were going to get this year, and it's not entirely clear when they will. And then, of course, the issues of, of race have, have uh, and most of you are too young to remember this, although my good friend Bill Higgs, who's a Lifetime Achievement Award uh, recipient with DCC and who I think is listening, will remember back to the, to the 1960s, in particular 1968, and, uh, and the way that that hung uh, as a kind of uh, uh, it just had a, a, an effect on the country um, that made everyone uneasy. Uh, and, you know, sometimes uneasy can be OK. But when you get these three things working simultaneously, it gets to be pretty overwhelming. And that's where you all come in. And that's where we, we all come in. I mean, w w as the previous speaker said, I mean, you, you can't shrivel up and and ho and just hope that things improve on their own. We actually all have to take have an interest in how this all proceeds. So let me give you a little uh, history lesson. Today in, in uh, 1982, September 29th of 1982, um, uh, the, the product, the Johnson & Johnson product, Tylenol, was discovered to have been um, poisoned. Where the capsules had been, not all of them, obviously, but enough of them had been um, tampered with and someone had laced them with cyanide. And of course, there were several deaths in and around the Chicago area. And I remember uh, that the, it was a real case study in how leaders, in this case, Johnson & Johnson's leaders, reacted to that crisis. Uh, they, they were transparent. Um, they were consistent in their in their messaging. They were decisive in the sense that they uh, they took near term actions. The total recall of their product, which was their number one product on the market, they recalled the entire inventory of it. And then not only thinking near term but long term, it's it was that incident and their reaction that led to tamper proof packaging. And so there's a case a case study in in dealing with a crisis in 1982, and today is the anniversary, as I mentioned, that, that is worth looking at. Because what, what I took away from that, and I still use it in my class here at Duke University, is that in dealing with any issue, you know, whether it's a crisis or something that falls just short of a crisis, 
um, there's a paradigm of problem solving that I, I have found useful, and I found useful as well in trying to be the the, uh, the principal military advisor to President Obama. And the the paradigm goes something like this: it's, There's the problem that you think you have. There's the problem that you actually have, and then there's the problem you can solve. And I always found it helpful to parse that out so that we would get as soon as possible to the problem we could solve, knowing that there would be others where we needed help solving them. But it was, but it, on the idea that having a bias for action in a crisis is always the right idea. And so getting to what is it about this that we can influence? What is it? What are the aspects of this problem that we can solve was helpful, but I couldn't just jump there. I had to get through, okay, what is it? What is it, What do we think the problem is? And then, as you learn more, okay, this is the problem we actually have. And then, okay, what can we do about it? And let me give you an example, because I put that thought to the pandemic, knowing that it's, you know, it's obviously foremost in many of our minds. So the problem that, if you recall back in March, that we were presented with in terms of this pandemic was we had to flatten the curve while working on a vaccine. That was the problem statement. Good start. But now, of course, we know that the problem we actually have in dealing with the pandemic is that plus federal versus state authorities. Obviously, we've seen we've seen that play out. Public health versus economic health, how quickly or how slowly, how aggressively or how cautiously to reopen the economy. Politics in an election year. I mean, it's a factor. And, it, and of course, we all knew it would be a factor, and sure enough, it is a factor. Mistrust in the era of digital echoes. You can see how social media and other uh, media venues play out in either helping us uh, understand what these uh, issues are or confusing us. And then finally, fear. Uh, it's, it's clear that the, one of the things we are dealing with with this pandemic, both because it's it's, you know, there's a lot we don't know about it still, but also in principally how long it will last and how long it'll take to develop the vaccine for it. We are dealing with fear and whether we acknowledge it or not and whether we are dealing with it or, or those who, who are entrusted to our care are dealing with it, it's out there. And then there's the problem we can solve. And I just jotted these down in terms of the pandemic. Listen and learn. I mean, you know, and, and, and make sure we are both listening and learning, communicating. I, I'm, I'm going to mention again in a moment that in these days, I think one of a leader's primary responsibilities is to be a sense maker, help make sense of things. And this is a great case for that. And then and communicate, in, you know, in fact, my compliments to ECC for not just postponing or canceling this thing entirely, because the, the simple act of staying in touch with each other may be about as much as you can possibly do, but it's certainly one of the more important things you can do. Um, I think that helping people feel a sense of belonging in times like this, because fear, the only antidote to fear is, is belonging. And I'll unpack that momentarily a bit more too. Building trust. I mean, there is a trust deficit and anything we can do to, 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 build trust is time well spent these days. And then finally, finding where is the opportunity in this crisis? I, you know, I hear people tell me all the time, I can't wait until we get back to normal. And I say, really? I mean, is that the best we can do? Or should we be thinking about, you know, what happened to us during this period of time that we can actually build on and maybe we can make you know, the next normal, a better normal. And and for sure, we ought to be thinking that way in terms of public health, because, you know, we'll get through this pandemic either, either you know, handily and, and elegantly or, or ham-handedly. I mean, we'll get through it, um, but it's not the last one. And so we've got an opportunity now to, to learn and to be better prepared the next time. But we have to take the time to see that. If we don't see it, we're, we won't do it. Okay, now... Here, here's the meat of what I wanted to talk to you about today. I think that given that leaders and followers both, we should have expectations of ourselves all the time, but especially in times that are more challenging than others. And so I'm going to give you a list of a few attributes 
Um, I've actually picked ones that aren't kind of run of the mill. I mean, we all know that integrity is important and selfless and service is important and humility is important. I mean, it is to me, I'm sure it is to you. If you want to be a good leader, if you want to be a good follower, those, you know, those kind of rise right near the top, dignity and respect. Um, but there's others, I think, that might help you think through this thing, um, whatever this thing is, whether it's, you know, challenges in the energy sector or a pandemic or, uh, or, whatever, or something that affects you in your home life. But here are the attributes that I would suggest to you are worth thinking about. The first is inclusiveness. You know, we went through the, at least I did, went through the, you know, the 80s and 90s and even the early part of this century uh, where diversity was the thing that we measured most closely. And I think that in the world I've just been describing to you, faster paced, more complex, where fear is actually a big factor, uh, scrutiny is a big factor. I think that inclusiveness is absolutely necessary. And inclusiveness is beyond diversity. As, as a good friend of mine says, diversity is a payroll issue. Inclusiveness is a culture issue. It's one thing to bring people of diverse backgrounds and thinking into your organization. It's another thing to actually use them, give them a chance to influence outcomes. And it's and for me, it's a pragmatic thing. You know, I mean, everything is so much more complex, at least it was in my judgment, it was back in my days in Washington, that I th it was important, I believe, to get people to genuinely feel included in in decision making and outcomes, both because it gave them ownership. It wasn't then me imposing something on them. They actually took ownership. And in fact, if it was international partners, for example, it was bringing resources to the table. Sometimes what we were looking for from them, sometimes less, but always something. And it was that inclusiveness, I think, that, that got us through that period. And I actually believe it'll be inclusiveness ultimately that gets us through this next period. The second is, with all those things distracting us, especially this thing right here, which I turned off, um, with all the things that distract us today, it takes work to be in the moment. Now, that's a cliche, right, in the moment. But let me give you a, uh, an example of when it was really important to me. I was in Baghdad in 2003 commanding the 1st Armor Division. And in that job, I had about 32,000 soldiers spread out around Baghdad and 50 camps and every day in groups of 12, they would go out on patrol. In the early days, roughly from March or April through August of 2003, it wasn't really that dangerous. It was just chaotic. You know, the, every, the, the institutions of government had entirely collapsed. Then it started to get dangerous in about August. And we started taking casualties. And as a commander, you know, you feel the obligation to understand why these casualties are occurring and what you can do about it. So I would... I made policies about becoming less predictable, both in terms of when you would patrol and where you would patrol and how you would patrol. But I really wanted to understand it better. So I went to, I took about a two week period and went to each of these 50 base camps. And when I did, I, I didn't check in with the senior commander there. I just drove to the front gate and parked, had my Humvee parked there. Because there was always a place in a base camp before a patrol went out where they would test fire their weapons and do their final preparations before driving out the gate. Because as soon as you went out the gate, you were in harm's way. And so I would wait there and when the patrol pulled up, I would grab the, usually it was a staff sergeant, somebody probably 30 or 35 years old. He was in charge or she was in charge of the patrol, had another 12 or 14 soldiers with him. And I just put my arm around the patrol leader and I'd say, are you here? And they would look at me like, hey, sir, I, you know, I'm getting ready to go out the gate. I got things to do. I don't know what you're talking about. And I'd say, look, I, I just want to know, are, are you here? And they'd say, sir, with all due respect, and I'd know that then I had their attention because that, that's code for, hey, sir, get the F out of my face because I got stuff to do with all due respect. And so I, knew, I didn't take offense to it because I would have said the same thing myself. But then I said, okay, look, let me put it to you differently. What were you doing 30 minutes ago before you got this patrol organized? And they said, I was cleaning my weapon. I was eating. I was talking to my wife on the phone, whatever it was. I'd say, oh, well, really, how's she doing? Good, good, sir. Thanks for asking. I'd say, how, how, I mean, really, is she doing well? I mean, she got everything she needs. The kid's okay. Uh, you know, sir, there's little things that happened. There was a flat tire, you know, the registration ran out, her ID card expired. Just, a, you know, there's a myriad things that can happen. 
And I'd say, okay, well, you know, um, I, I, I said, look, we all go through that. But I said, what I really need to know now is, are you here? And of course, the light bulb would go on because they understood that if he's going to go out the gate, he's got to be able to compartmentalize that stuff. And everybody in the patrol has to be able to do that. It can't be that half of them are there and the other half are, you know, dreaming about something else going on in their lives. Well, you know, that's an extreme example in combat, but I'm telling you, it, I've seen it in the workplace where people who are in a meeting may not actually be there. And I saw it in the White House Situation Room. And President Obama was actually quite adept at picking up on it. And, um, and so my point in mentioning this to you is, as leaders and as followers, we've got to be here. We've got to be there. We've got to be in the moment. And I think it's harder to do, but more important to do. Um, sense makers. President Obama used to tell us, he'd say, look, ladies and gentlemen in the sit room, I've read all the briefing material. Uh, this is our fourth meeting on that topic, whether it was Syria or, or Iran or whatever it was. And so, I, you know, I, I, the two things I don't want are for you to, you know, regurgitate everything we've been through already. And the second thing is, you know, assume that we'll just have another meeting. And so this one's not that important. He said, this is the meeting. And he said, I want somebody in this room to surprise me. And it might actually be someone who sees things because they're not, it's not really their equity. They're, it's not their personal responsibility in this room. But a question that might link two things together in a way we hadn't seen it before is extraordinarily important and helpful. And so he would say, I want somebody to surprise me. I found that to be very helpful, actually, uh, in getting through really complex issues, especially when you have people in the room who may only have marginal equity in something, but they know that they're there to participate, to be in the moment, and to try to see a connection that maybe the people who are too close to it may have missed. And so I, I offered that idea of sense-making. Character. I mean, look, I just personally think that in our country, the, the country that, you know, that, that I believe we are, it's not only what we accomplish, but how that matters. And that's certainly true in the military, and I know it's true in a lot of organizations, and I hope it's true in every organization. And just a small example of that, I used to get really annoyed if I was, you know, in a meeting and we were the, the chief of staff of the Army, the Navy, Air Force Marines, and we're arguing about something and, and somebody's not arguing about it, just sitting there. And then I go out in the hall later and they want to come up to me and, you know, tell me something or they, I, over the water cooler, I hear them talking to each other about something that belonged in the room. And, I, and that's what I would say to them. I'd say, look, this doesn't do me any good, doesn't do you any good. Say it in the room. If you've got something to say, say it in the room. And I think we're in one of those moments in history where we got to say it in the room because, you know, the chattering about it outside the room to each other or, or even worse, on social media or someplace where, you know, it might make you feel good that you get 200 likes on a particular day, but it's not going to accomplish anything. And so... I think uh, that's that's a reflection of character in my judgment. Uh, don't hurry. John Wooden, the famous basketball coach from UCLA in the 60s, wonderful team. He would tell his team, be quick, but don't hurry. And I never really understood what that meant, but I but meaning it never, you know, it wasn't a light bulb moment. But over time, I actually did begin to understand that if you're a team, you, the team has to move at a pace that it can sustain and a pace at which it can it has enough bandwidth that it can also be alert for opportunities. If it's helter skelter, everybody's rushing, uh, then you're not going to you're going to miss something. And, and the team may not be with you. They just can't keep up with you. So it's not that you have to, you know, the 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 antithesis of that would be we're going to dumb ourselves down to the lowest common denominator. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a leader's responsibility to move the organization at a pace that it can sustain and that gives itself the best opportunity to see opportunities as it goes along. And then last three, consistency. I, you know, look, what everybody really wants, it, besides the sense-making thing, I mean, everybody's eager for a consist, something consistent that they can latch onto. And, and I think that's a, a responsibility both of leaders and followers. The last two are oddly worded, but I enjoyed the, the phrase. One is sensible skepticism. I mean, look, you know, I, we talked about social media. We talked about the, you know, ubiquitous information and, 
And what that does is, it, you remember John Adams in the 18th century said facts are frag uh, facts are stubborn things. No, nah, not so much. Not anymore. They're fragile, actually. And so I think we all have have an obligation to first of all to see as many different sides of of an argument as we can possibly absorb, and then to apply our own experiences and instincts and be a little sensibly skeptical, a little sensibly skeptical about it. Not not in the way of being cynical. That's that's gone too far. But sensible skepticism works. I used to do that all the time when I got reports from Iraq and Afghanistan. I'd get one report from military operations. I'd get one report from the intelligence community. I'd get another report from the State Department. And, and this won't shock you probably, but they were all different. One were, some were more optimistic than others. They were just different. And I found that being a little skeptical about them allowed me to actually knit them together in something I could then take to the president and say, Mr. President, here's how we're doing in Afghanistan, or here's how we're doing in Iraq. And the last one is responsible rebelliousness. And I mention that because, I mean, think about it. Most change occurs only with a little bit of rebelliousness. You know, somebody's just gonna stay inside the box and right down the, the center line on the highway, nothing's gonna really change. So I innovation and change always occurs when there's a little rebelliousness, if the rebelliousness is done not for self-aggrandizement or for self-serving purposes, but rather for the organization. And the, and the challenge is to articulate, you're not gonna see responsible rebelliousness on an organizational you know, PowerPoint slide of values, but you can find it in really good organizations in their culture, where they know that they can push on the edges of it as long as it's not being done for themselves, but rather for the for the be, for the accomplishment of the mission, and for the uh, betterment of the team, so that's the last one. The last thing I want to tell you is, you know, just to help you get through all of the things we're we're working ourselves through. And I, you know, I agree with the previous speaker. I mean, this, I, I, who knows how long this this particular way we're having to live our lives will last. I mean, you'll hear people optimistically suggest it's, you know, we're within weeks and then you'll hear others months and then you'll hear some suggest that it's years. And as I said, I, I, uh, I, you know, I think that this is not the last pandemic we'll face or the last crisis we'll face. And so the question is, how do we keep living the lives we want to live by and as by end at the same time, uh, make sure we're, we're helping each other. And, and one of the things that I did when I was in Iraq, and began losing soldiers was I really wanted to find a way to remember that I, I didn't want them their memories just to fade, at, you know, when we had the memorial service. And so I had I had cards made for any soldier that I that I lost in Iraq and Afghanistan. And um, and then what I did was after they became I used to carry them in my pocket, but that became a little uh, unfortunately cumbersome. So I, I we had a box made. And there's the box, and it sits on my desk and has since 2003. What I want to highlight, though, is, or, and draw your attention to is the phrase, make it matter. I, I used to walk up to soldiers at memorial services and say, look, just make it matter. You know, you can't, you, you're feeling guilty that your teammate didn't make it back and you did. You're, you're fearful of going back out because you lost a teammate. And you're not sure what to do about all that. And I said, you, you know, you don't, first of all, understand that's completely normal. But secondly, here's the way to, to turn this into something powerful in your life. Make that sacrifice matter. You live your life from this point forward, understanding that your teammate couldn't fulfill his potential. So you have a deeper obligation to fulfill yours. Make it matter. Now, that's a military application, but I actually in my heart believe that we can always make things matter for each other, for your family, for your fellow Americans, for your your workers. Uh, you know, and it, and sometimes you'll make it matter in big ways. You know, you'll, there'll be an opportunity for you someday to make a big difference in people's lives. Uh, most of the time, it's you're not you're going to make a little difference in someone's life. A handwritten note, a pat on the back, a, a word of encouragement. Um, you know, it's, it, it doesn't take much, but if that's part of your daily ritual, this idea to make it matter, then um, for something and somebody other than yourself, then I think you're probably on the right path to be both an exceptional leader and an exceptional follower, and you're on a path 
to help all of us get through these very challenging times. So I wish you all the best. Thanks for inviting me to the 52nd ECC. And uh, maybe someday in the future, we'll, I'll be back and we will be at San Marco Island. Thanks very much. Okay. General Dempsey, thank you for that, uh, that wonderful speech and uh, several little takeaways that we can take back to our uh, everyday life. Uh, for the audience, there is a chat box on the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, if you want to ask any questions, I think we've got a time for a few questions, uh, General Dempsey. Um, so while, sure. while we're waiting, we've got some that we can go ahead and ask. Um, so the first one is, you know, as we are six months into the COVID environment and working from home and uh, isolation, you know, what can you share with us based on your experience? Uh, so how do you keep your troops or people motivated? How do we as leaders keep our people motivated during this time of uncertainty so that when we do turn back around that we are focused and we can react and, and you know, continue in the positive trajectory? So, you know, what lessons can you share with us from your, your time in the uh, military? Yeah, thanks. And obviously, I never, I never experienced anything like this. I mean, we, truth be told, in 2014, we feared something like this with Ebola, but it, it, we, I think we got ahead of it, as did the, uh, the, the international community did a pretty good job. But to your point, again, what we're trying to do is help people overcome fear. And, you know, as I said, fear of health, fear of you know, job and, and way of life. And, and then, uh, you know, just the, the fear of the unknown, but, you know. And so, again, back to uh, making sure people know that they matter, you know, that they belong, and that that comes with expectations, that they'll be helping you figure things out. Uh, not only do they belong, but that their contributions matter. And then I think you have to be really candid. And, and let's just take the pandemic. Uh, let's fast forward to March. And I, by the way, I'm not a doctor. My, my initials are RMD, and I have stayed on occasion at a Holiday Inn Express. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Let's fast forward. Let's fast forward to March. In March, there, there'll be a vaccine. I'm pretty confident of that. Uh, there'll be some percentage of the country that won't want to take it because they've lost faith in it, or, or it could be part of their faith but they won't take it. Let's just call that 10%. And the vaccine will be about 50 to 60%. Let's say 60% effective. And so the question then is, are we gonna stay like we are now with that 40? Right now we, we're, we're dealing with 100% risk. In March, we'll be dealing with 40% risk. Maybe six months later, we're dealing with 20% risk. And I know there are people who say, well, we got to just stay with this till the risk goes away. Well, well, that, that's not, I don't think that's, I don't think that's feasible. I mean, I, I know businesses that can't afford to wait for another year or, or they won't any longer be businesses. And so I think that we've got to be very candid with each other about, about the real risk. And then we've got to find ways to mitigate it. And I, and there are ways to mitigate it. And, uh, but I don't think self-isolation is necessarily something that can last for very much longer. And so, you know, but we can only have that conversation if, if, if we're focused on the pandemic and its effect on the economy and we don't find ourselves arguing about which is more important, you know, the pandemic or the economy. The answer is yes, they're both important. And so we got to figure that out. And, and I just think being candid, making people feel like they belong, their contributions matter. I, you know, that's been my formula. And again, no, I never dealt with anything like this. Okay. Okay. Thank you, General Dempsey. We've got a few more questions coming in. So let me ask uh, one more. Uh, do you have any advice around making long-term strategic decisions in the midst of a crisis? You know, how do you avoid over overreaction. I mean, like you said earlier, we are in a 24-hour news cycle. Everything is instantaneous. There's a lot of overreaction. So how do you how do you keep from overreacting during this time of crisis? Yeah, right. And 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 you, you're exactly right. In any crisis, there's there is the tendency. People tend to gravitate to one of two positions. They they either want to um, uh, you know kind of desperately seek to restore the status quo, 
actually there's three positions. One is people get paralyzed. And some people do. I mean, some people in a crisis just shut down. And, and that's we have to help them overcome that. Other people focus entirely on, okay, what's the opportunity here? And then, as I said, there are, are people, there's people that kind of are in the middle of all that. And they're, they're probably the ones that you want to enable and empower. But the, but the point is it affects everyone differently. And look, I, you know, um, there was, I, there, the question is really one of strategy. And so let me tell you that you'll, if, if you were to log on and Google, you know, strategy, you would get five, six, seven, eight, ten different answers about what strategy really is. Some people say it's balancing ends, ways, and means, you know, the objective, the uh, resources, and the campaign plan. Well, that is actually one definition of strategy. I, my personal um, favorite, I suppose is the best way to put it, is that strategy is about choices. And, you know, one of the choices we make in a, in a time like this is action or inaction. And, you know, each of them has its own uh, outcome, its own uh, benefits, and uh, some of them have some vulnerabilities. But the point is, that's a, that's a conscious decision, action or inaction is a conscious decision. And generally, we, we do a good job of articulating the risk of action. We do less well at articulating the risk of inaction. And I think that sometimes the longer term, to the longer term detriment of what we're trying to include uh, is that we fail to articulate the risks of inaction. So I would just think in the one case about, you know, as you, as you look ahead, make sure you account for both the risk of action and the risk of inaction. The second, the second thing I would say is by our, by ourselves or others or by yourself or others. And it sounds like an obvious, it sounds like an obvious decision, but it, generally speaking, it doesn't turn out to be so obvious. Like, I mean, for example, you know, the, with this pandemic, are we going to try to solve it by ourselves or are we going to, um, you know, accept the the inefficiencies and potentially the corruptions of the WHO or our closer allies, the NATO allies, or, you know, whoever, or, or, or. But the, but the point is that's another conscious decision. How much ourselves, how much with others. I, I do think there are some issues that no country can solve by itself. And I think health is certainly one. Climate is probably one, depending on how you feel about, about the climate. Uh, migration is probably one, you know, things that just doesn't really pay attention to borders. And so, you know, there, in my judgment, those kind of things require coalitions, you know, of, with like-minded, reliable partners and allies. And then there's other things we'll decide to do by ourselves. And that same paradigm, action or inaction, by ourselves or with others, applies in everything from, you know, national security, you know, to your own household during this, during this time. But they got to be conscious decisions, and if and if you don't make them conscious decisions, you'll kind of whipsaw, and that's when people begin to wonder what you know, who's going to help us figure this out. So I think those conscious decisions have to be made. Okay, thank you, General Dempsey. I think we're out of time, so thank you very much for the informative speech. And uh, as you mentioned, we do look forward to the day when we can meet in person. So thank you, thank you again, General Dempsey.